Welcome. Thanks for tuning in to our Linden Road online worship experience. We're glad you're here. And if this is your first time, you could do us a favor by uh, clicking on the digital connection card up in the corner or leave a comment here in the chat. Or if you'd like and you're watching on YouTube, if you'd scroll down all the way down, you'll find a link there. We just would love to know who you are and maybe how we could pray for you. And and would invite you to leave a question if there's something you'd like to know more about. And we'd certainly try to answer that. And we certainly hope it's not your last time. And if this is your spiritual home, we are grateful, too, that you've tuned in and pray that things go well for you and are glad that you've been able to join us here. And if there's something, again, that we need to know, please use the digital connection card or the the comment here on the side or actually scroll down in YouTube and let us know what we need to know. Uh, But together, we're grateful for the many things that we uh, can partner with here. As we come to worship today, I want to share with you some prayer requests from some uh, friends. As you know, I've shared over the many months, I've been doing some work inside uh, the Mansfield Correctional Institute through the Ministry of Prison Fellowship, and and recently we asked the men if there's anything they'd like to have prayer for, and so I'd like to share a couple of those now. First, one of the gentlemen shared that he was grateful that we were coming in, and he wanted us to pray for his wife and for his uh, children and then also for his grandchildren and then to pray for him, that God would protect his family and that God would also consider giving him a shot at freedom if it's his will. And then Jimmy asked that we would pray first in detail uh, to think about who he is and he knows that he's uh, planted bad seeds in the past, but he also knows that he's doing some good things and so he wants us to pray for the people Uh, for the good seeds that he's planted and that we would also ask God the Father that he's thankful he's given him a heart of thankfulness and love and joy and peace and that he's able to demonstrate these things in the name of Jesus. And then finally one of our friends asks that we pray for his son James who needs prayer because of his uh, addictions and his drug problem and he wants him to meet Jesus and so let's take a moment and, and pray for these men. Father, we're grateful for the work you do inside the prisons, and so we lift up these particular prayer requests and many others that I know are there. We know that we can stand with these brothers to give them encouragement, knowing that we've prayed for them. And so send your Holy Spirit this morning even to bless them to know that you are present to them in the midst of their journey and this chapter that they're walking in. But we're grateful that we can stand with them, and we pray it together in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. We're in our fourth week of our series here called Created to Dream. In the first week, we talked about the idea of faith and how important it was. And then the second week, we talked about just how to have initiative and how to start. And then last week, we did a deep dive into unpacking just this idea. How do you have faith when it seems like God isn't showing up? And this week, which helps us better understand the last three weeks, is the idea of being persistent. You got to just keep going at it. Now, as we begin here, we look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, we have around us many people. It's talking about those people who were in the Bible, uh, whose lives tell us what faith means. So let us run the race that is before us and to never give up. So what does the Bible tell us? It tells us that life is like a race. It's like a marathon. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't finish that race very well. And why is that? Well, we're going to unpack that here today. It's because we get discouraged and we get distracted and and then even we get hurt uh, because relationships and life are really hard. Now, we need to be reminded that whatever God starts, he's going to finish. But that's not true about us as human beings, right? That's something that we struggle with. Uh, And many of us, uh, when we start something, we end up getting tired and we get bored and we get distracted and then we move on. And we leave a rubble of unfinished projects behind, even unfulfilled commitments and unkept promises. And it's all because we get discouraged. So if that's part of your story, this is going to be a good week, I think, to unpack together. How do we understand ourselves being created to dream? And how do we understand what God's purpose is for us? Let's begin first with this simple idea that what we need to do is 
remove any distractions. So the rest of that verse there in chapter 12 says, let us run the race that is before us and never give up. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. So what is he saying here? He's basically saying we need to remove anything, anything that gets in the way that keeps us from running our race. Now, as we've talked many times, we need to understand that each of us have been created for a unique race that only you can run and that all of us have a different life to live. And yet the problem is other people want us to run their race and that's where it gets messy. And so as you go through life, people start putting expectations on you, right? It starts at home with your parents. They put expectations on you and the kind of life that they want you to have. And then your friends and peers, they put expectations on you for the kind of life you're supposed to live with them. You're the people you work with or your friends, and they're all well-meaning people, but all of them put expectations on us. And it actually, they can become distractions about who we're supposed to be because we can't live somebody else's life. We have to live our own. And then those distractions can load us down. Paul says the key to finishing a good race is to simplify our life, to get rid of the baggage, the distractions, the diversions, all those things, all those things that are a time waster in your life. Now, let me ask you this. What could distract you from your life mission? What could distract you from the purpose you were put on this earth to fulfill? There is a lot of things. One thing is to trying to be like other people is going to distract you. Another is making wealth in uh, tangible things, material things, the goal of our life. Because if that's the goal of our life, then we've missed out on what God's purpose is all about. Or even our habits can distract us from finishing the race. Or the wrong kind of friends can distract us. Or uh, television even, right? Now, what does the Bible say? It says we're to remove these things. And I have to say, too, one of the things that I think distracts many of us is our past. Your past, my past, keeps us from finishing the race, and it basically loads us down. So many people are loaded down with either guilt over the things that they have done wrong or resentment over the things that other people have done wrong to them. And so when you walk around with that kind of guilt and resentment or shame and bitterness, it's shame over things you've done, the bitterness or resentment over the things others have done to you. It's like trying to run the race with two bags of garbage on your shoulders. You just can't do it because it's going to slow you down. And then what happens? We get stuck. We get sidelined. We get tripped up by other people. We get tripped up by ourselves. And then we continue to hold on to those hurts from way back and we refuse to forgive. And then we keep beating ourselves up over some bad decision that we made a long time ago. All those things are distractions. Now we know the Apostle Paul, he had a lot of regrets. And he did have a lot to regret, didn't he? And before he became a believer in Jesus Christ, he was a religious terrorist and he went around killing people. So he had a lot to regret. But notice what he says in the next verse here. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race. It's verses 13 and 14. He's saying here, I'm not going to let the things in my past keep me stuck. I have a race to run. I'm going to focus on the finish line, not focus on the hurts that have been done to me or the hurts that I've done to other people. We need to do that too, you and I. And so to be persistent in life, to finish what we start, we're going to have to conserve our emotional energy for the future, not for the past. I think that makes a lot of sense. We need to focus all of our emotional energy on the future, on what God's going to do, and let worry and regret and guilt be in the past. So we're going to have to let go of some grudges, and we're going to have to let go of some of the guilt, and we're going to have to let go of the grief. Now, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 43:18. I love this, don't dwell on the past because it will be a distraction. We want to finish well. The second thing you and I have to do is remember the reward. Remember that God has put a reward out there in front of us. If you're going to finish well in life, you have to remind yourself, I have to remind myself of why we do what we do. Otherwise, why even make the effort, right? It's this idea of the why. Why do we do it? It's the why that's behind what you do determines how long you're going to last and what you do. If it's all about immediate gratification, you're not going to last five minutes. And if it doesn't show up, you'll stop. 
if the why is something that's short-term or long-term satisfaction, you know what, that's not enough either. It'll last a little bit longer, but the only why behind what we do that makes sense for any of us that lasts all the way through life, through some of the toughest things you have to face in life, is the eternal reward that God gives us. So when we feel like giving up and when you feel like you're not going to make it, sometimes the only thing that will get you through is to say to yourself these words, my faith will be rewarded. So here in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, chapter 9, to win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. But we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. So I run straight to the goal with the purpose in every step. Now, I want us to clearly understand this reward isn't based upon something that we do. It's not something that's on a balance scale. It, it's all of, not because we do something, God does something in return. God rewards us based on this idea, this concept called grace. We've talked about it before. And so here's what grace means. Grace means that all the wrong things I've done, all the sins I've committed, God erases those and forgives every one of them when I put my faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Which means, and you notice there's a thread in this series, it's about faith ultimately, because grace means that every good thing that I do in life is by faith. And because of my faith, God rewards everything. Every word that I speak by faith, God's going to reward that. Every thought, every prayer that I've prayed by faith, God will reward that. Every action by faith, God will reward that. Every single one. And that's what you and I have to look forward to. God made us and he fashioned us to look forward to that reward. So think about this in your life. If you're having a tough day at work, what happens in the middle of the day? Well, you start thinking about the way you're going to reward yourself on the way home, right? And if you're having a tough week, you think, well, at least there's the weekend. Uh, you're going to do something creative and different on the weekend. And then you look forward to that reward. And if you're having a tough year, you start thinking about, well, at least I've got that vacation. So let me ask you this. What do you do when you're having a tough life? What do you do when the weekend isn't long enough to be able to help you make it through? Or that there's no vacation good enough to give you hope in life? And there's a lot of times in life when the only hope, the only strength that's big enough to help us make it through is to know that you can finish well to encourage you in tough times is knowing that God has a reward that is out there for us, personally given to us. We look at ourselves sometimes and we all think, why can't I get motivated today? Get an amen, right? <laughs> sometimes the reason is we need a higher motivation. The next paycheck, even the next business opportunity isn't enough to motivate us anymore. You need a motivation that can only come from the reward that God is going to give as we're faithful to him. There's no external motivation. There's no internal motivation, but it's eternal motivation that will keep us going and moving. Again, the writer of Hebrews 6.12 says, Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and then get everything promised to them. Think about that word promised. One of the ways you can focus on God's reward in eternity is by focusing on God's promises right now. So let's take a look at this verse in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. We've looked at it before. He says, let us not get tired of doing what is right, for after a while we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. I think all of us could use that verse, right? We could all use that understanding right now. What that leads us to is this third point today is that we need to resist all discouragement. See, if you want to fish what you start and you don't want to get discouraged, you've got to remove the distractions. And then you've got to remember the reward. And then you have to resist all discouragement. And you don't give in to it. We have to fight it. And I know many of us are discouraged right now. We're discouraged about our health and about finances, maybe about our marriage. You may be discouraged about your children or your desire to get married or your desire to have children or your desire to even maybe change jobs. Maybe you're discouraged about your finances or a personal problem. Whatever you're discouraged about, I want to say I'm sorry. But I also want to say as a pastor... And to be honest, to tell you that that's a choice. That you are discouraged because you're choosing to be discouraged. And that is a choice. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. Nobody's forcing you to feel discouraged. The truth is, discouragement is always a choice. It's like any other attitude we take. 
And so if you're feeling down, if you feel like quitting, if you feel like giving up, it's because you're choosing to think discouraged thoughts. And we need to be reminded we don't have to do that. In fact, the Bible says don't do that. It says do the exact opposite. It says fight the discouragement, resist the discouragement, move against it. It's interesting that this idea of discouragement is the evil one's number one tool to making us ineffective. And then his second favorite tool is procrastination. And if he can get us either discouraged or to procrastinate, then we're locked up. Forget it. We're, we're toast. Uh, so he's going to mess with us, and he's going to either mess with us through discouragement or procrastination. The great pastor D.L. Moody once said, I have never known God to use a discouraged person. Why? Because it's the opposite of having faith. And you'll notice that's what we're talking about in this whole series about create the dream is to wrap our mind about what does it mean to have faith and how to be persistent as we're talking today in our faith that we can then see that our problems when we look at them through God's eyes are not problems at all. We can have faith. I want us to unpack a little bit more here of Galatians 6. He says, let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Now, notice that what he says here is that you don't get tired of doing what is right. How many of us have ever tired of doing right? We do get tired doing what is right. And you want to know why? Because it's easier to do what is wrong. If doing what is wrong was hard, nobody would do it. It's easier to be undisciplined than disciplined. It's always easier to lie than to tell the truth. It's easier to be selfish than it is to be unselfish. It's easier to be codependent and put up with things rather than confront someone in tough love. It's always more difficult to do the right thing. That's why it takes energy. It takes effort. And that's why we get tired of doing what is right. So it takes energy to do God's will. Notice it says, don't get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, and we need to look at that, we will reap a harvest of blessing which means if we don't give up, whatever we give to God, he multiplies. As we talked last week about the farmer, right, and his understanding of how God works. We know when we plant the seed, we don't get a plant instantly, right? No, there's always a delay. There's a time period. You have to wait. You plant in one season, springtime, and you harvest in another season. And then there's summer and fall too, right? There's always a delay. You just don't get instant gratification. God is not a vending machine where you put in a prayer and instantly get it. So let's take a moment and talk about why does God delay our prayers. He delays our prayers because he's stretching our faith. It's not I pray for it and bam, it happens instantly. There is always a delay for a while. People will say, I'm going to start following God's principles of finance. I'm going to start tithing. So they start putting God first and giving 10% back to God. And then they expect the very next day, all their financial problems will be cleared up. It doesn't work that way. There is a delay between planting or sowing and reaping. It says, after a while, we'll reap. So what do you do after that, after a while time, when you've done the right thing, but you haven't seen the reward yet? What do you do? What do you do in light of that? Well, it says, keep on doing what is right keep on doing the right thing. What I have to say is probably one of the greatest tests of faith is how we handle these delays. How do we handle what would appear to be setbacks? When you're doing the right thing and you don't see the immediate reward, the immediate results. When you do the right thing, even when nothing is happening, what do you do? Do you have a pity party and invite yourself to it? Or do you start complaining? Do you start griping? You start saying, forget it, I'm going to give up, this isn't worth it. No, the Bible's pretty clear. It says that we need to resist discouragement. He says what? Keep on doing what is right for a while. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Don't give in without a fight, is what he's saying. Here's what we need to understand. Anything worthwhile in life takes effort. It takes energy and it takes endurance. Nothing worthwhile is easy in life and anything worthwhile takes effort energy and endurance. You just got to keep on keeping on, as they say. I can say this much as we think about life, and we can count on this, is that God will test our faith in life and he will test our commitment. He's not going to test it a hundred times. He's going to test it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Why? Because he wants you to learn about what's inside you. And second, he wants you to learn what he is like and depending upon him. 
Now, I know that when we start unpacking these things, we need, all need to understand that life is tough. There's no being around the bush about this one. Life is often very tough. This world is not heaven. All you have to do is watch the news and see the terrible things that we see happening in, in the Middle East right now. Things are not perfect here on earth. Life is tough. And as you go through life, you often start to get tired and you start to get discouraged and you begin to doubt yourself and then you begin to doubt God and you start saying things like, maybe this serving God thing isn't what it's cracked up to be. We start having doubts and we start thinking, if I just let up the pedal a little bit, not have so much gas in my life, maybe become a lukewarm Christian. It, this thing's going to be real. Our minds can be filled with discouragement. And there can be a point where we feel like quitting. And what do you do? Well, let's look at this next verse here I want to share with you. It comes from Psalm 94, 19. Lord, when doubts fill my mind, when my heart is in turmoil, quiet me and give me renewed hope and cheer. Wow, that's so beautiful. It's the idea of pausing and reflecting on God's goodness. This verse tells us two things that we do when we're filled with doubt and want to give up. The first, it says, quiet time. The first thing you need to do when you're filled with discouragement is to sit down and shut up. You need to be quiet. Most of us are not quiet. In fact, we don't even like quiet, right? Quietness can scare us. If we sat here for five minutes, we wouldn't know what to do. Seriously. So let me ask you a question. Are you ever awake and quiet at the same time? I mean, there's a practice that we need to lean into. Some of us, the only time that we're quiet is when we're asleep. From the moment we get up, the radio goes on, the TV goes on, or you pick up the paper, or you pick up your phone, start scrolling, checking out the social media tabs. You see, our entire life has become interactive, and that's not a good thing. One of the things that I've come to understand is that the less silence you have in your life, the more stress you're going to have. The less silence, the more stress. And that the idea, and I, I want to give a promotion here again, we have it here in the worship notes, the pause app from Ransomed Heart Ministries. from John Eldridge's good work. You can subscribe to it and you can set the time and twice a day it will send you a message on your phone just to pause, to take a minute or even five or even 10 and reflect on what God's doing right there in that moment. You ought to do that. Take a look at it now. It's here in the worship notes. And so the second part of that Psalm tells us that he says what? And renew me, give me renewed hope and cheer. How do you do that? Well, we do that by focusing on God. When you focus on God to relieve discouragement, you want to do three things. You want to focus on God in your past. You want to focus on God in your present. And you want to focus on God in your future. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first, you want to remember God's goodness to you in the past. To remember all those amazing times that he's shown up, that he is a good God, that you remember his presence with you, and that he's with you even now, right? Even though you don't feel it. And then this idea of realizing what he's done brings him even closer to us here in the present and to know that he's with us right here in the moment. And then finally, this idea that the, he, there is a promise in the future. And when we focus on that, it is impossible to be discouraged and focus on those three things. What causes discouragement in our lives is looking at our problem. We look at the world and then we're distressed. And then you look within and you're going to be depressed too, right? But when you look at Christ, you are going to find peace and you're going to find rest. So the question is, what are you looking at or who are you looking at? And so then also we need to see here that the secret of defeating doubt and discouragement is this. It's to change our focus to God, to change our focus to his goodness, his presence and his promise. Again, Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished. What God starts in your life, he finishes, and he's not through with you. That's an encouraging word right there. So let's do a little self-inventory here quick. Take a look at this list. How are you doing with this list? Uh, how about your daily time with God? 
How about praying for your family and your marriage or those you might be in a small group with? How about sharing your faith with friends who don't know Jesus? How about your tithing of giving to God's work? How about your exercise and diet? How about controlling your anger and your words and your thought life? And how about trusting God with your pain and your problems? So yeah, take a look at this list and where do you need to be more persistent and to finish what you start? Because I'm gonna guess when we start looking at these things and maybe you're there where we sort of say, I'm just at a quitting point, that you're ready to give up, that you can't do anything more, that you're just done. But I want you to, to know that you can take it. And there's this last step that we have to do, and that's to number four, to renew myself daily. So what have we said? We said in the race of life, you must remove any distractions. You must remember the reward at the finish line. You must resist all discouragement. And then you've got to renew yourself every day. Renew myself daily. If you're going to last over the long haul, you must figure out how to recharge yourself, both physically and spiritually. You've got to learn the art of mid-flight refueling how to keep on keeping on and still get recharged. First, we need to learn physical renewal. The psalmist says in chapter 127, verse 2, God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Okay, how are you doing with that? And I know many of us are probably not doing well at all with that. The first part of this verse in the Living Bible translation says, it's stupid for you to get up so early and stay up so late for God wants his loved ones, his children, to get their proper rest. No wonder you're discouraged, because fatigue will make cowards out of all of us. That's what Vince Lombardi said. And then the second thing is that we need daily spiritual renewal. Again, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, this is why we never give up. Our spirits are being renewed every day. Now, how does that happen? How do you get spiritual renewal? It's by spending time with God. That's the secret of persistence. It's the secret of endurance, if you will. It's the secret of finishing what you start is to focus on Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at this next verse here. Let us keep our eyes fixed on television. No, that's not what it says, right? No, it says, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. You see, he didn't give up because of the cross. Jesus had to face something far worse than you or I are ever going to face, and he didn't give up, and that's our hope. And how was he able to do that? Well, he knew the reason, and he knew the reward. And so when you plug into his power, you will have the power of persistence. So really what it's about is opening our lives to Jesus and saying, I want to run your race and to engage in a way that will be new and fresh. And so let's pray. Father, life is often very tough and many of us feel like giving up. I know people are watching this that are at a quitting point. I pray that you'll strengthen their faith and help them finish this race and complete what they've started. And we pray it all through the strong name of Jesus. Amen.